She's a filmmaker, she is a producer of the documentary What's With We. She's an international and TEDx speaker, health expert, lifestyle coach. She is the author of Changing Habits, Changing Lives, which is a bestseller. Uh, the Australian Financial Review and Westpac 100 named her Women of Influence Awards for 2016. In 2016, she was also the Australian Organic Lead Tailor of the Year finalist. And in 2016, she was the Sunshine Coast Sustainable Businesswoman of the Year. So, Cindy's basic sphere of passion is health, wellness, well-being, particularly through diet, uh, lifestyle, and today she'll be talking about the different forms of activism. She's a real example uh, to all of us of someone who can make a much bigger and broader impact in the community on this message of balance and harmony and, and important and positive lifestyle choices. And she's got a lot to share. She really is a genuine powerhouse in her field and she really has a powerful message of activism and how we can help create a more sustainable future for generations to come on this beautiful planet. So please make welcome, <laughs> Cindy O'Meara. Thanks, Anthony. <laughs> Thank you. That was a lovely um, beginning. You know, I've been listening to the last two speakers and I don't live in that world. I actually live very much on the planet in what I do in nutrition. So I won't be talking about anything astral traveling or anything like that. It'll be very much practical things that you can do. I have had past life experiences. I've also had future life experiences. I've had loved ones, my mother and sister, come to me in dreams and tell me what it's like. So I do have that understanding of it, but I'm very much loving nutrition, I love food, I love agriculture, and that's what we'll be talking about today. So I was brought up in a family where my dad was a pharmacist, my mum was a nurse, and my dad decided to become a chiropractor. And he changed and flipped his reality of how we need to look at the world. And basically what he had was a paradigm shift. He shifted from a very mechanistic way of looking at health to a very vitalistic way of looking at health. And a paradigm shift is a time when the usual and accepted way of doing or thinking about something completely changes. And people do that, but I don't think we can fight against paradigms. That's when someone's very mechanistic in their thinking with health versus vitalistic. I don't think we can fight against it. And so I don't fight it. I give to people a philosophy, a philosophy that is based on historical perspective, how we did use, we ate, how we did things versus, uh, and also with that vitalistic lifestyle as well. And that is that you have an innate intelligence, that your body is incredible. Give it the right resources, it can be the best it can be. If you are someone that is suffering from ill health, and you're not giving the body the right resources, which is good food, sunshine, exercise or movement, as well as good quality sleep, connection, love, spiritual practice. These are all important things that we have to do in order to give our body the ingredients so it can have an intelligence to be the best you can be. I turned 60 last couple of weeks ago and I can tell you that my father going from pharmacy to chiropractic and mechanism to vitalism, chose to never give us any medications, chose to not vaccinate us back in the 60s. So I stand before you without one medication ever being taken in my life, from antibiotics to Panadol to anything. My children are now 31, 29 and 27 nearly, and they too have been brought up in this lifestyle. I know it works. It's, and I know I'm not the only one that can say this. There are many that actually say it. So what I want to do is maybe change the paradigm for you in what you're consuming. So many people choose foods as a result of maybe the nutritional label. They might say, oh, this has got this much fat, this much protein, this much carbohydrates, and that's the macronutrients. Or they may, they may choose it for the vitamins or the less salt or more salt. Or It's just this crazy way of looking at food. For me, I look at the ingredients. I want to know what's in that food. I want to know how it's made. So, Instead of looking at the nutritional label, which is the whole of Australia has been told to do that, I was taught that at university 40 years ago, 
I want you to look at food very differently, I want how you source food. This is what I believe, is the true cost of food is not what costs you in a dollar term, but what it costs you and the planet in health. And I can tell you that we used to buy our foods like this, but now we buy from something like this. And what we're seeing is a human health crisis. I'm a 1960s girl. I remember school. I remember nobody had ADD or ADHD. No, I don't remember autism being there. I don't remember anybody having an allergy to peanut butter. I used to take, or peanuts, I used to take peanut butter, banana and honey sandwiches to school every day. My mum was an American, that's what we did, you know. There was none of that happening in the 60s. Nobody was overweight that I remember in my school. Actually, a lie. I went to a, a school of 600 girls. There was one very overweight girl in the school. She was Italian. The, nobody else that I remember had that. And I don't know if that was because she was eating pasta or why. I have no idea. But one person out of 600. Now, the rate of children's health is, is there. 30% of the kids now are overweight. But look at the chronic disease issue. In 1965, 2% of the complete population had a chronic disease. Chronic disease being heart disease, cancer, diabetes, obesity. Cancer is even a chronic disease that we're now seeing. Because it doesn't take overnight for you to get cancer. It's chronic, it takes a long time. Now we are in 2018, that was the last statistics that the Australian Bureau of Statistics have done. And we now see that 38 to 40% of our kids have a chronic disease from autism to allergies to food sensitivities. We now also see that after the age of 65, that 80% have a chronic disease. Well, I'm five years from that. I don't have a chronic disease. I'm not going to be part of that 80%. I'm going to do everything that government says to do differently. I do the opposite. I don't get this whole thing that's been happening over the last, since March or February, whenever it all started. We have to wash our hands. We have to social distance. We can't connect with people. Uh, and I can't remember the last, the third thing. Where's the, the diet, the sunshine, the exercise to make us healthy? Is it the germ theory or the terrain theory? I'm very much into the terrain theory. Keep this healthy, you can combat anything. But we're not keeping this healthy because we're being told things that aren't for health. Not only do we see human health issues, but look at what's happening to the planet. Because of that's mainly food packaging, probably cosmetics and things like that, but a lot of it is food packaging. Because we're buying foods in packages with ingredients that list forever, as opposed to buying foods that come from the ground. Five years ago, um, well, let's go back eight years ago. Eight years ago, I had, um, was getting health issues aches and pains, sore back pain, sore hip pain, migraines, tightness in my throat, couldn't grow my hair, dry skin. I was still eating well. I knew how to eat well. I've been a nutritionist for 40 years. And I thought I'd better do something different because if I continue to do the same thing and expect a different result, that's the, the definition of an insanity. So I decided to do something completely different. I wiped out everything from my diet, but very small pieces of protein, large amounts of green vegetables and winter fruits. And in three weeks, every ache, every pain, everything disappeared. And that was eight years ago now that it all disappeared. And I figured out what the biggest issue of all was something that I was consuming. And I'm gonna talk about more about that as we go on. But once I removed that from the diet, nine kilos were lost, never put that back on, felt incredible, clarity of mind. And you know when you feel like that? You feel like you want to be an activist. You feel like you want to do something different. So because of that, I did a lot of research on the food, which was wheat. I then decided that I didn't trust the agricultural industry anymore. And so I bought a farm. I bought a farm in Mullaney, 60 acres, where I have cattle for regenerative farming purposes to improve my land. I have fruit trees. We planted 600, we've got about 440 that have survived because the cattle keep knocking them over. I have chickens um, that help spread all the poo that the cows have been um, putting down on my land. And we have the most incredible, prolific, food producing place. And 
My husband never really understood my love and passion for this until all of this happened this year. He decided that what we were doing was right. It was right for our family, it was right for our community and it was about improving the planet's health, animal health and human health. So that I don't have to buy packaged foods, I don't have to use these things, I can choose not to do it. We have three things that are joining together. Bayer has just bought Monsanto a couple of years ago. Monsanto was the food and agriculture. Bayer was a pharmaceutical company from Germany. They were part of IG Farben, if you know anything about IG Farben, but they were part of that. And they, um, you know, they were part of war crimes and they have basically conglomerated in order to control our health, our eating, and the way we do agriculture. And what's really scary is what I'm seeing. So people are believing that animals should not be consumed and the vegan movement is in, increasing like you wouldn't believe. And it's okay, the vegan movement, but not when I see this. So this is what is in a fake egg. I could show you meat and chickens and everything. It all looks like this. I decided I didn't have the time to go through them all. I thought I'd give you the egg. So I found this egg in a plastic packaging that will end up there, no doubt. So I found this egg and look at, well, there's no food in there. Oh, water there is, mung bean protein, but that's not a food, a whole food. Um, expelled canola oil, doesn't say it's organic, could be genetically modified, could have Roundup in it. All of these are not foods, but they've got masters at things. They've, they know how to make food taste like food, look like food, smell like food, but not be food. Because this is what's happening. And they're using a new form of way of creating those additives. And it's called synthetic biology. Synthetic biology is where they genetically modify a microorganism in order to make an additive. For instance, they may take a bacteria, take the gene out of the vanilla bean, insert it into that bacteria, that then will make natural vanilla flavoring. And they call it a, new, a synthetic route to natural. And they call it natural vanilla flavoring. Citric acid is synthetic biology. Xanthan gum is um, synthetic biology. Colors, more and more additives are now being um, made with this. There's a new disease that started when this started. It's called Morgellons. And it's where people actually see fibers, red, pink, yellow, green, orange, start erupting from their skin. The thought is that this is one of these microorganisms that has escaped the fermenting vats and gotten into the human microbiome and microbiota and is producing what it's meant to be producing, which is fibers for the textile industry. So I'm wondering about the vanilla flavored making bug. Will my poo then smell like vanilla? That's what I'm wondering. <laughs> <laughs> Who knows? I just, I find this crazy. We don't know the ramifications of doing this. Do you know that they have genetically modified a virus and they put it on meat to kill listeria? Did you know that they're doing this? You can go buy a piece of meat at Woolies or Coles and if they're doing it, you are none the wiser. You're having a genetically modified virus that kills listeria. They see the good in it, I see the big picture. Mechanism is looking down the barrel of a microscope and seeing something. I actually see the big picture and Magellan's disease is just part of it. If you want more about this information and I can't tell it all to you in 30 minutes, can I recommend that you get my new book Lab to Table. I have some copies out there and you're welcome to purchase them for $20. They're normally $30 but I've got them for $20. I'd also recommend you watch the documentary What's With Wheat because you'll realise why wheat was my issue and what was happening to the wheat industry. You can go online, I don't have any DVDs, I'm sorry, but you can go online and watch this, in, this documentary with the most incredible experts that will help you understand what is happening in the food industry. But one of the things that I say at the end of this documentary is wheat is the story of food. It's what's happening to our food and it's why we're getting sicker and, well, it's one of the reasons we are getting sicker and sicker. So the chemical agriculture started 
back um, in 1892 with arsenic and lead. And now there are many fields in the US that have so much arsenic on it and they're growing rice on it that the rice has, has an infinity to, affinity to arsenic and it's taking it up. And so we're eating more and more arsenic. But I want you to know that your body has the ability, if you ingest it, to get rid of it, if it's working at its best. So all heavy metals have been on the planet forever. You will be able to get rid of it as long as your microbiome is working to its efficiency. Then DDT came along, 1945 to 1972. It was banned. But this is the advertising. DDT is good for me. My mother was born in 1937 in Iowa, USA, Corn Belt of the US. She was born in 1937, and in 1939 they sprayed arsenic and lead on the cornfields and about 14 states of the US because of a locust plague. By 1945, they were spraying DDT for nits, on waterways, on swimming pools, on verges, everywhere. My mother had my sister in 1959. She couldn't eat for the first three months. A lot of women have that problem purging or vomiting because of that's what's happening to your body because of the hormones. And she lost a lot of weight. DDT traps itself into the fat cells. It's a protective mechanism. When you don't eat, those fat cells are released and so is the DDT. My sister was no doubt bathed in DDT. Both my mum and my sister passed away from cancer. Despite living healthy lifestyles and doing the best they could, and I often think about my mother and think if she didn't live that healthy lifestyle, she probably wouldn't live to 69. She was the oldest of 11. All are dead but three. She would have been 80 this year. So I've been very much touched by these chemicals. Our animal husbandry is appalling. We have free-range chickens, and then we have chickens that live horrible lives. We just bought a whole bunch of chickens just recently. We give them great lives. And I said to my son, I went, two of them have their beaks pecked off. They've cut the beaks off. And this is what, I don't know if we got rescue chickens. I didn't ask my son what we did, but they'll have a good life. They'll live, they'll survive. I don't know if the beaks come back again. I've no idea. I'll let you know next time I speak. Our cattle have the best life. I watched a calf. Well, just, I got there just as the calf was born last Tuesday. They have the best life. They're there to fertilise our land. We have mamas and we have babies and it's just the most incredible experience to just be around those cows and their community. We, and pigs. Pigs, oh my God, I cry. My uncles had piggery farms and I didn't know that there was something wrong with it when I was 15. But I walked into an old piggery farm that had been abandoned recently and it was shackles and chains and it was just the worst. But we, our pigs can live beautifully as well. Animal husbandry is gone. But I feel that this is the camel that's breaking, um, or the straw that's breaking the camel's back. And that is the spraying of glyphosate. Glyphosate, otherwise first known as Roundup, I think is the elephant in the room that we are not looking at. That I, is what caused the problem with the wheat that I was eating, because I'll soon tell you what they're doing with wheat and glyphosate. So let's look at the history of glyphosate. In 1964, it became a descaling agent. That means it took minerals out of solution. So if you're consuming it, you're getting minerals dragged out of your system. In 1969, it was patented as herbicide by Monsanto. By 1974, it hit the shelves. And it hit the shelves by um, advertising on footballs that, um, you know, there was this guy and he's got two guns, but they're guns of Roundup, and he pulls them out and he kills the dandelion on his um, driveway. We're told it's perfectly safe, there's nothing wrong with it. By 1996, we have Roundup ready crops. Soya, canola, cotton. Um, corn becomes a BT Roundup Ready. So we have all these things happening. It then in 2000 in Australia becomes a desiccant of crops. All your legumes, most of your grains are desiccated with Roundup. So what it does is it gets it to come to harvest all at once. As it dies, it pulls up more seed. Um, it's a cleaner harvest. We're told it's perfectly safe. There's nothing wrong with it. The human food allowance is 30 parts per million. In animal food allowance, it's 100 parts per million. How many pets are now dying of leukaemia? 
or um, lymphoma, sorry. How many are dying of it? I know of many people who say to me, oh, my cat, my dog had lymphoma. Soybeans, it's allowed at 120 parts per million. It's still food, I don't get it. So drinking water higher than 0.7 parts per million increases in infertility and kidney problems. And yet they're allowing it in our food. The Australian government, the Australian Pesticide and Veterinary Medicine Authority have deemed it okay to register 596 products in Australia containing glyphosate. That's a lot. When I had a go at them, they said there is no evidence that there's anything wrong with glyphosate. Yet, IARC said that it caused cancer. And there are now 140,000 plaintiffs in the US claiming compensation because they have lymphoma because they used Roundup thinking it was okay. The first person that um, went to trial, he got a two, no, $296 million payout. Of course, Bayer, who owns Monsanto now, has said, no, we're not paying that. The next one, I think he got a hundred million and the last, the couple um, that last went through got two billion dollars. Most of it was in punitive damages, which means that they knew what it was doing, but they refused to tell the public that they were doing it. So this is where it's used. So we have our farmers that are using it preceding. So it's the most widely spread um, chemical on the planet, um, herbicide on the planet. Councils, verges, playgrounds, sports grounds, waterways, dog parks, main roads, roadsides. Um, and highways. You can see it. You'll see it on the post. There's this brown spot around the post. Um, you can see brown. You'll, once you start to recognise this, you'll see where it's being sprayed. Acreage owners, backyard gardens, land care, national forests, state parks, body courts, schools, all spray this thinking that it's safe. And I found some in my dad's shed when I was cleaning it out. Um, we moved my dad out of the family home last year and I couldn't believe I found Roundup. Obviously he hasn't been listening to me. So 70 different foods in Australia are allowed to be sprayed with glyphosate or some product like glyphosate. Could be in the pre-planting of the crops, could be on the genetically modified foods, it can be around the food, and it can be as a desiccation of crops. So your potatoes, your sweet potato, they don't want all that green stuff on top. So they kill it and then they're able to get the potatoes out without all that ruffle or the, the dried um, tops. I don't know if you've noticed that, but when you want to um, pick your potatoes, once it starts to desiccate, then you know that's right. Well, they just desiccate it themselves or dry it themselves. Foods containing glyphosate that we now have tested. By the way, in Australia, this is incredible, 144 chemicals uh, have to be tested in Australia for the supermarkets. So these foods have to be tested to make sure they're under the parts per million that is legally um, put out by our F Food Standards Australia and New Zealand. Roundup, glyphosate, weed master, but glyphosate is not tested in that 144. Which mind blows me considering this is the biggest herbicide um, or the largest um, amount of, of this herbicide is sprayed on our crops. So you can see it's in wines, we're finding it all GMO derived foods. Much of um, our food is derived from wheat, soya, corn and canola. If you're eating a vegetable oil, no doubt you'll be eating genetically modified um, produce as well as glyphosate will be in it. We've got, um, it's in our lucerne, breakfast seals, chips, crackers, breads, baby cereals, coffee, tea, fruits, nuts. Um, it's basically in so many things. And I've had arguments with farmers who say there's nothing wrong with it, it's perfectly safe, the world will not be fed without Roundup. But we know that that's not true. Environments that contain glyphosate are waterways, verges, playgrounds, dog parks, sports grounds, town water supply, rain, forests, national parks, state parks, roadsides, orchards, fruits and nuts, vineyards, coffee and tea plantations. I was walking along the Lullabar Beach the, um, it was April this year and I noticed about five people inside um, the dunes where there was some growth and I noticed they're picking weeds out. So I said, excuse me, what are you doing? I always do this. 
what are you doing? And they said, oh, we're just um, picking out this weed. I said, what's the weed? And he, they said that. And I said, so it's just mechanical picking out, you're not using a herbicide? And they said, oh, no, we use a herbicide. And, and they have, like, this thing hidden. It's not, they haven't, I, there's no signs out that this is happening and I'm within a foot of what they're doing. And I said, what are you spraying? And they said, Roundup. I said, there's no sign here to tell me that this is happening. Otherwise, I would not be here. It's water soluble, it goes into the environment, I'll be breathing it in, and I know the effects of it. And you don't have any protected clothing. Are you crazy? So, you know, you've got to do these things to get people thinking about it. So this is in the science as of 2019. And the science just keeps increasing. So who said it's a possible carcinogen? What does possible mean? One before car, so there's many categories. So possible carcinogen, it's a 2A category, means that it, it is just before, yes, it definitely causes cancer. So it's a 2A um, class carcinogen. Monsanto paid $17 million to discredit the IARC report. $17 million. It collates those minerals. And when you have a look at these minerals, you'll start to see that we are getting deficiencies in these minerals. It affects something called the shikimate pathway. That's its biochemical reaction that it does. And the shikimate pathway affects your neurotransmitters. Therefore, you don't think as clearly as you could. You may get Parkinson's, muscular sclerosis, or some neurological condition as a result of not having your neurotransmitters. So it stops that being formed in the food and your bacteria produce those for you and if you're killing off the bacteria because remember it was patented as an antibiotic in 2000 I didn't say that but it was written up there it was patented as an antibiotic in 2000 broad spectrum if you're consuming it you're killing the microbiome in America today 78 percent of the people in the US now have gut issues that's not right. We should not be having gut issues. Um, it also stops iron. I'm noticing a lot of people with iron problems. So it stops the carrying of iron um, through um, a carrier called Enterobactin. And it also stops folic acid. Fasans, in their wisdom in 2009, thought they'd better put folic acid into our breakfast cereals, into our breads, into our flours, because they were seeing folic acid deficiencies. So why don't they just take glyphosate away? Um, so it's an antibiotic to the microbiome, but Listeria salmonella and Clostridium diffidus are resistant to it. That's why they've had to create this virus to, that kills Listeria so that we don't get sick. Um, it damages the epithelial lining of the tight junctions of the blood-brain barrier, which allows aluminium and heavy metals to get into the blood-brain barrier. Alzheimer's and dementia are now increasing. It down-regulates vitamin D. Who lives in Queensland has a vitamin D deficiency? That's crazy. If you are sleeping and you spend 10 minutes in the sun every day, you should be producing the vitamin D that you need in order to be healthy. And yet, we're told that 150, I can't, re I think it's deciliters, I can't remember the exact thing, but the 150 figure, and most people are in the 70s, I know people that have done the right thing and can get their vitamin D up to 350. Um, destroys the ecology of the soil. If you don't have the ecology in the soil, you don't have good bacteria in your foods, you don't have nutrients in your foods, you don't have minerals in your foods, and then you're eating foods that are devoid of any nutrition. And it goes on, and it continues to go on. So this is my activism. This is what I do. You can support these companies that ruin your health, animal and planet health. You can choose to support them by going to the grocery store and buying these foods laden with additives, preserves and flavorings. Or you can support companies that improve animal, human and planet health. It's not hard. It's a matter of just doing a little bit of education and my book Lab to Table will help you do that. It's a matter of just doing that, going to your farmers markets, talking to your farmers. Do you spray this? Where did you get that food? Are you just buying that from the Rockley markets or where, what's happening here? I, um, I walked up to a food stand one time. Before I opened my mouth, the guy put his hand out and he said, hi, I'm the farmer, what do you need to know? That's what I want to know. Grow your own food, then you know exactly what's happening. 
So for me, I support the companies that will support human health. Now, I spoke to Dr. James Mukey three weeks ago. He's um, Australian of the Year 2020, an ophthalmologist. He wants to change the dietary guidelines. I said, good luck with that. I tried to change the tuck shop at Matthew Flinders 17 years ago and that didn't work. <laughs> I said, I'm sorry, but this has to be a groundswell. This has to change from making their decision that that's what they're going to do. Or if it's not a family, it's one person in that family that then becomes the example that influences their family and friends, then their community, and then a, pla a country and maybe a planet. Because if you don't start making these changes, we're not going to have a planet. In order, or we're not going to have soil that enables us to grow the food in order to do this. My farm sequesters carbon. It basically holds water because of that sequestering of carbon. We hold more water on that than my neighbours. In a drought, there's a fence between my neighbours and me. It's barbed wire, nothing else. It doesn't go to the, the, to the clouds. It's just a barbed wire fence. My grass is lush and green, despite no water, because my ground is holding water. Theirs is brown. And I've taken photos of it, I wish I'd put it up, but I've taken photos of it and it's quite incredible. So I support people that are going to support our planet, our animals and our health. So this is how we become activists. We choose foods without additives and extensive ingredients and packaging. We choose fresh local foods and regenerative farming practices. So it doesn't have to be organic. There are farmers out there that don't want to go through the organic certification. They are regenerative farmers who care for their soil. And if they care for their soil, their grass is healthy. And if their grass is healthy, their cows are healthy, their plants are healthy, their chickens are healthy, their eggs are healthy. These are the farmers that you need to find in your local community. These are the um, fruit and vegetable stands that you need to find in your local community. You will find them. There are community supported agricultural boxes just about everywhere because there are young men and women that want to be farmers. They want to get back on the land. They want to have something to do with helping this planet and they know that the land is where it's at. So, um, choose your fresh, your local foods. When you're looking for foods that we can't get in our local community, then find an ethical company. So changing habits, um, you can see what I'm like. That's my company and we have foods that we have sourced where we can't get them in Australia but we're able to get them around the planet and we bring them in only because they are high in nutritional value. And, then, and you can't get them here in Australia. So we bring them in, um, but we don't bring any fruits, no vegetables in. We don't bring in, um, we don't bring in, we bring in spices because not all spices can be grown here. We bring in things that you can put in your pantry and you know that they are organic and they are safe. Grow your own food. Um, on my education arm, so I have an education arm called the Nutrition Academy, we have the incredible edible garden. And you can learn to grow your own food with Mirag Gamble. I don't know if you guys know Mirag, she's quite famous around the world. And she teaches you how to grow food. This is how I grow food. I make sure my soil's good. I stab something in it that I've been told I could stab in it, and it grows. So you don't need a green thumb. I'll go and see, find some mint from somebody's garden. I'll drag something out throw it in my soil, make sure it's watered, make sure it's got some of my cow manure on it or whatever, and it grows into the most incredible mint um, plant. Grow your herbs. If you live in a unit, get pots out and start growing your herbs. Make some difference to your nutrition and your health. Um, refuse to buy any foods where glyphosate is being used. And that's legumes now, and that's grains. So buy organic. That's where certification for organic is good, when it's the one ingredient that they'll work well. Um, call your local council and ask to be put on the chemical sensitivity register. The more of you that do this, the more of the people, the councils are going to say, oh, maybe there's, you know, there's going to be some real problems. I've actually written to my council, and um, you'll have this here, 
Um, take photos of this. So changing habits, letter to local council. You can go there, get the letter to your local council. You just have to change that I'm on the Sunshine Coast. You just change the name of the council. Find out where you send it to and make sure you send a letter to your local council telling them that you are not happy with Roundup and glyphosate being sprayed in your local um, places. Um, I've also um, written a letter to APVMA telling them that they should not be registering the 596 products and this is um, why I say it. So it's all written for you. Make sure you read it and change where you need to change for where you are and what's upsetting you. But basically those two letters are written. And then I've also written an article that you can go to that's about activism, can take many forms. So you can be a loud activist and you can go pick it and do whatever you want, or you can be a quiet activist. And a quiet activist is someone who is making choices using their money to make the right choices. So we are not supporting those companies that are ruining our health, animal health, and the planet. Thank you.